What's up, Gasol Education Nation? Today's episode is brought to you by The Payday Practice and our good friends Jeff Langmaid and Jason Deach. So how would South Gooden, Gary Vee, and Tim Ferriss create a chiropractic practice? The answer is in this book right here. So our good friends Jeff Langmange and Jason Deach, uh, they created the payday practice to basically show you how you cover your monthly expenses in one day every month. Guaranteed, generating monthly recurring revenue in your practice can create financial freedom, eliminate chronic financial stress, and turn the first day of each month from, damn, it's time to start over, to payday. Get a free copy today at www.thepaydaypractice.com. The Payday Practice will show you the exact step-by-step process that you can use to generate monthly recurring revenue in your practice. Get your free copy today at www.thepaydaypractice.com. All right, everyone, welcome to another episode of the Consultant Education Show. Uh, today, we are with uh, the man, the myth, the mustache, uh, Professor Stuart McGill. We are here in Gravenhurst, uh, uh, Ontario. Did I do that right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> this is my first time in Canada, so uh, what, a, what a pleasure to be up here. Uh, Stu, you've uh, been so influential to, to me uh, through Brett, through all my mentors 100%, through your research, through your, your stuff, and I know that uh, you've been a... a a huge uh, mentor to Brett, uh, not only through teaching, but also through your, your publications yeah. and stuff like that. And so, uh, can we start off, Brett? Your uh, you tell the story a lot, but I think it's worth telling again. Your first kind of encounter with uh, with Stu. Yeah. So we were, uh, and I don't even know if you remember this, but uh, uh, Clayton and I had hosted you down at CHP, and so Clayton was like, you know, we got to find a patient for uh, Stu to see. So uh, I always say the lady's name was Nancy. I don't know if that was her name. So anyways, I'm working with Nancy. I'm doing, you know, hip hinging. We're doing the McGill Big Three. We're doing all the things. And uh, so she's basically telling us she's an 8 out of 10, 10 out of 10, not getting better. So I'm still a student. So um, so when Clayton asked me that, I'm like, oh, this is going to be perfect. I was like, I'm going to give... Uh, I'm going to give Stu Nancy, you know, so you work Nancy up. And uh, the way I tell the story is I did everything very close to what you would have done. You know, like I would have been pretty proud of the job. And I think you would have been proud of the job that I did with Nancy. So Nancy, I am not helping Nancy one bit. Okay. So you do your workup, you do your thing and your mystique, your just ability to, to uh, handle the, the case one-on-one like you did. You get done with Nancy and she literally is like, oh my gosh, my pain's gone. I'm a one out of 10. <laughs> and the reason I, I think it's so important to talk about healers and people that are working with patients, part of their gift is the certainty, the confidence, um, the empathy. There's just intangibles to helping people besides the whatever the technique is. So that was uh, that was my first exposure to Stu McGill. Now I had you know we had read all the books, and uh, to me, uh, Stu is definitely on the Mount Rushmore of researchers for for low back pain, of course. So, uh, but that was my. The first one that was absolutely thrown in my face, and uh, I, I tell that story quite a bit, honestly, because I think it's 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 so telling on how important it is to communicate well with your patient and to be a good healer. The, the intangibles it takes to, to do that. So, oh, I, I don't remember this at all, but I wonder <laughs> what was it that made her response to me any different than you? I think because I, you know I was an intern, I was a student, and. Yeah, I think just the the mystique, the the what certainty, the the message that it came from you was uh, portrayed differently, mm-hmm. probably. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I don't have anything to say about that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. About that. <laughs> yeah. Well, well yeah. let's uh, let's continue on. So, uh, Stu, so you you're recently. Uh, you say retired. You're semi-retired now. You're no longer at the, at the school doing reactive research and stuff like that. But you're still seeing patients here. Uh, you're you're still uh, have some side gigs and, and you're doing some stuff on the side. But the reason we're sitting in these spots right here, and you've told the story on several other podcasts, is because when you see a patient in uh, in your home office, uh, this is where it all starts. And so I think the first conversation that Brett and I really want to have with you is is your first hour interview is something that you hold very valuable in that patient encounter. And so 
Could you maybe talk about uh, why you have it set up like this and maybe just kind of start us down this road of, of the interview process when you see a new patient and uh, some of the things that you're really looking for? Yes. I should probably start off by describing the type of patient that I attract. There's no one who has fresh back pain and says, oh, I better go see McGill for my back. That doesn't happen. They go to the usual accessible uh, clinicians, people like you. Um, the patient I get has already seen the chiro, the physio, perhaps the osteopath, perhaps they've been to the pain scientist, they've had a surgical consult, and they've failed all of these. So that's the person who then somehow finds their way here. I have to be different. I have to understand what were the impediments that caused all the other clinical attempts to fail. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying I have a 100% a success rate either, but it's important to establish where the person is coming from when they walk through the door. I usually sit in my kitchen. You're now in my house. And when a patient comes, uh, I only see patients two days a week, and I would see one in the morning and one in the afternoon. So I have a good at least three hours with uh, the person. I watch them get out of their car. I'm already looking and doing pattern recognition on uh, the line of drive of forces through their bodies. I'm seeing where the stress concentrations are occurring. I watch them walk. Uh, is there uh, an intelligence is there one foot that's lagging, uh, etc.? Are they looking down? Uh, some of them are out there checking their phone and they come in and tell me, well, every time I, I look down, I get back pain in the lower part of my rib cage. And I say, well, aha, uh -huh, I have a context for that now. <laughs> but then they walk in and I mimicked this after our experimental research clinic at the university which the interview room had won an architectural award. The patient sat on a very comfortable couch. Now, comfortable, you'll notice you're sitting on a prisoner's bench, very hard. <laughs> that is a two and a half pound foam inside the couch that we had custom made to give uh, support. And then I offer people uh, a back support and a pillow. Now, if uh, Brett was the patient, I would say, I've just given him a way to mitigate the stresses that are causing his pain, but he's chosen not to do it. So I can give him back exercises and it won't make one little bit of difference until I've already seen now uh, he doesn't recognize that he has the opportunity now to down-regulate the pain mechanism. Mm -hmm. So there would be part of the assessment, and I haven't even really said a hell heck of a lot to yeah. them, and, and I don't know what they're expecting from the assessment, but it starts even examining the patterns in the email. Are they desperate? Uh, are they blaming everyone else, uh, etc.? Then you'll notice we have uh, a nice view outside the window. You're sitting in front of a fireplace. The fireplace is going when the patient gets here. And remember now, I'm searching for why they failed all the previous attempts. It might take an hour sometimes before it comes out that this person is abused. They cannot do exercises at home because of their husband or, or for whatever. Or they live in a dangerous neighborhood and they couldn't go out in the evening and go for a walk, which would be uh, the best thing they could do to once again desensitize their back pain. So they end up sitting in front of the television, which is probably the worst thing mm. for their particular subcategory of pain. <laughs> or sometimes it's just so simple they'll tell me a few activities that trigger their pain and then i'll say well what can you do that doesn't cause your pain and they give me the mechanical opposite so now we can go downstairs do the assessment and i know uh, i can make the assessment very efficient so the front end of the uh, investigation of this individual is very short. But anyway, that's what I'm looking for up here. I, I usually just start by saying, how can I help you or tell me your story? And I don't say another thing. And they give me the, uh, uh, it, it shows me their learning style. So I'm taking in ideas of how I'm going to coach them. It tells me what the motivations are in their life. They might tell me about their hobbies or their family and things that they want to do and they can't do. So I'm making notes of all of this so I know what I'm going to use in the motivation uh, part uh, towards the end when I'm showing them what 
my opinion is on what they should do. Anyway, there's just a little bit of a start. And then I do have some large payoff questions that I will ask them as well. Uh, if I suspect they have a little micro movement of one of their spinal joints because they say, oh, when I, I bent forward to flush the toilet, my back went out on me. Well, there's only one or two candidate mechanisms that would explain that. So then I'd say, well, do you ever get a sharp pain when you roll over uh, in bed at night in your back? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I get that. Okay, well, there's the big money question mm -hmm. on if the joint uh, has a little bit of laxity uh, uh, to it. Or if uh, I'll say, T tell me about the time uh, throughout the day, the diurnal variation of your pain. Uh, how are you when you first get out of bed in the morning? Oh, it's terrible when I first get out of bed in the morning. It's the worst time of the day. Good. Tell me about your mattress. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, obviously, I don't see people from Gravenhurst. They fly in from around the world and they stay uh, usually at the local hotel. I know they have a Simmons Beauty Rest Extra firm with a very generous pillow top commercial grade. <laughs> I know exactly what they slept on. And when they say, but you know, this morning I didn't have that pain. I say, good, let's go home and have a look at your mattress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So do you see it's, it's a combination of pattern recognition and really getting at the things that uh, the typical investigation in the clinic is not done. Yeah. Yeah. And then how often are you, um, are you confirming then with your assessment downstairs? Uh, or, or like, uh, maybe let me rephrase that. You're drawing conclusions with the interview at the beginning, but then are you pretty good about just like, you, you knew it right away. You go to the assessment and boom, there it is. Sometimes uh, through the process of the interview, I am forming hypotheses which are going to hone in on my uh, assessment. Now, you can imagine some people are, are incredibly fragile when they come in. So I've probably got the opportunity to do three provocative tests on them and any more will flare them up. Mm -hmm. Everything will be disguised after that. So then I'm thinking, what are the very best tests I can do to understand their pain? Because everyone has a cost to it. Mm -hmm. Or this is a robust person. They've, uh, they're just back from the Olympics. They're, they're in pretty prime shape. I'm gonna have to push this fellow under 800 pounds before I get to see what the pain pattern is. Or I might have to take them to fatigue because they don't have back pain until they get fatigued. And then it's the little movement mistakes in the condition of fatigue that triggers their pain. So uh, I can, I, I know I have a huge capacity to test that person. So all of these things, I'm, I'm putting together what the assessment is going to look like. It's a very living thing. Every assessment is different. So I don't know if that answers your Did question or not. But uh, James Syriax was so big, like on the the history, just like you're talking about. Yeah. And I want to I want to really ask you something because we talk a lot about this with some of our guests as far as our ability in a history or in our assessment to get a pretty good idea of what the pathoanatomical diagnosis is. So we have a, you know, a certain uh, faction of the world right now in rehabilitation who's trying to tell us that that's not important and that's not possible. Uh, what do you think about that, Stu? Well, I started 40 years ago and I would have to say with my clinical colleagues at the time, the competency of performing an assessment was much higher. What I'm trying to say is the uh, ability to perform an assessment and the skill and art of assessment has really declined. Yeah, I agree. So people might be swayed by that kind of an argument, but I don't buy it. Uh, first of all, uh, we are going to generate hypotheses to know what to test. Now let's see if we can create the, 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 the pain by manipulating different postures, different motions, different activities, and different loads. Mm -hmm. Now we know posture and loads migrate stress from one tissue to another. Now let's start migrating those stresses from one tissue to another and find out when the patient says, that's my pain. Right. Then we play jazz on it. So let's say, uh, we, well, I hope we're going to do some assessments downstairs in the clinic, but the person might be sitting there and I'll say, well, tell me about your pain. Oh, my left toe is on fire right now. Good. Look up. Oh, it just made it worse. Okay. Well, how, what, what did I do with my neck that changed the pain 
in my toe. I changed the neural tension. In fact, I allowed the neural tension to decrease, sliding the spinal cord caudally. But if it's, it's a peculiar way of, of some nerve bulge uh, architectures, if it's underneath the nerve root and I look up, which is the opposite of a slump test, what everybody is taught in school because it's a reliable test. However, it's a highly nonspecific test. Sure. And I'm always looking for the specific tests, the ones that require the skill and art to get a good uh, read on it. So I slid the head, uh, or I extended the neck, I slid the nerve root down into an underhook. Bingo, the, t the toe uh, uh, lights up, versus a traditional overhook, which would be much more common. The slump test increases the symptom rather than the uh, opposite. Uh, and then we might say, okay, well, what's the cause of that? Um, let's put the spine in a posture, and I'm the guy who's put people in MRI machines, and I've, I've uh, had one friend, he had a, a, a posterior lateral left disc bulge, and when we put his head in that position for 10 minutes, there's the bulge, and we put his head in the other position for 10 minutes, the bulge had disappeared. Uh, so the MRI showed what he had done in the previous 10 minutes. In any case, let's replicate that on the toe. Okay. Um, and then the symptom just went away. What did I do? Well, we replicated the stress to absorb uh, or cause that uh, uh, pressurized bulge on the nerve root to uh, retract just a little bit. Can I prove that? Yeah, we, that's what we used to do in the laboratory with, with active disc bulges. So the last part of that reasoning is Let's lay a bet, then test it, and then confirm it by giving the mechanical antidote. And immediately, if the pain goes away, and we wrote a paper in Spine, you might be aware of this, on immediate resolution of pain by changing posture, stiffness and stability, mm -hmm. and movement patterns. And we had an Olympic volleyball player, a world record power lifter. I mean, these were no slouches and we could take their pain away by following that idea of very precisely uh, defining what the mechanism was in terms of motions, postures, and loads uh, and activities, then giving a mechanical antidote. And sometimes we might come up without an explanation at that point. And just before we started recording, I gave the example of the Tarloff cyst. There was a woman sitting, she says, well, I, I don't have any back pain, but when I drive, I get excruciating pain down my leg. In fact, it went to her, her great uh, toe on the right side. So what's different about sitting and driving? Well, you extend the knee a little bit. So I said, all right, extend the knee. And now press on the accelerator pedal. She goes, yep there's my pain. And then we played jazz on migrating the nerve roots from above and below. And I said, there's something hanging up the fifth lumbar nerve root. It's the great toe. It can't be anything else right. unless sometimes I know we have signs of fascia stain and some of these other things. But I knew if I went along that nerve root, I would find something. And sure enough, there was a Tarloff cyst sitting just outside the uh, foramen. And uh, that was... Uh, her issue. So I am not skilled enough to do anything with the Tarloff cyst, but I knew who to send her to and, and who did have those skills. So th there might be a, a, a story um, where it took many levels of logic and investigation, but the, logist took a, the logic took us to a very precise understanding of uh, why she had pain. And they're not all that complicated uh, as well, but it, it allows us to hone in through making the pain worse, giving the mechanical antidote, and knowing whether they need mobility or stability. Not to a mechanical precise target, but to a very precise understanding, being at a joint micro sure. movement or, yeah. or whatever. So no, I don't buy that. And uh, that's the reason why. Yeah, I don't either. Um, so 
no one's herniated more disc in a lab probably than uh, Stuart McGill. So in all of your studies of nuclear migration, you see certain papers like from Alexander and Fazzi that tell us the disc is very dynamic and is moving. And then you see other research that the disc is not moving. It's caused people to question like in the world of uh, McKinsey, like if we get a miracle of people doing 10 press ups, is it because we've actually moved the nucleus of the disc? You know, what are some of your thoughts on, and I know the age of the disc matters, but uh, do you have an opinion on that? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> Let's go, baby. Well, I remember, again, uh, I come from an era when we would go to the international spine meetings and I just used to love talking to, uh, you know, people like Robin McKenzie and Robin is a wonderful fella. And uh, we, we had these, I think I ended up doing probably more work on this than, than people inside the McKenzie Institute th themselves. Yeah. I, I think that would be a fairly accurate claim. Right. And we would create partial disc herniations. And in fact, a PhD student of mine who was a McKenzie trained physical therapist named Joan Scannell. And uh, for her master's thesis, um, we took uh, spines, they happened to be animal spines, and we partially herniated them. So a partial herniation is uh, one of the, there's several ways to create it, but one of the most potent ways to do it is you add a certain amount of compression and you flex the spine over and over again. And the mechanism is this. The disc is not a ball and socket joint, obviously. It's an adaptable fabric. So if I wanted to work a hole in my shirt, I would create stress strain reversals back and forth like this and the fibers would slowly delaminate. Well, here's the rub. The annulus is layer upon layer in a fabric-like manner, uh, fibers of collagen held together with a ground substance, but it contains a pressurized nucleus. And the nucleus, when you lift something, gets an enormous pressure. And when we used to measure intradiscal pressure, we had to use a catheter that measured chemical explosions. I mean, the pressure is absolutely enormous. Sometimes we create a herniated disc and the nucleus would across the room and splat on the wall. It is an incredible <laughs> pressure. You know, just to cut an artery and watch it spurt. Well, the nucleus is much higher pressure than that. But in any case, so... Um, if you just take a spine and move it back and forth over and over again, you, you, you can't create a herniation. We, and, and then we did studies on Middle Eastern belly dancers who did tremendous mobility, um, but they didn't have disc herniations as a rule, unless they strength trained on top of it. Right. Um, so uh, going back to this idea of uh, delaminating the collagen, so Joan would partially and then we'd repeatedly x-ray it after we injected a radio contrast so we would watch the nucleus seep through the layers so we'd open up the layers to laminate them as the as not the collagen became soft but the ground substance holding the fibers together became soft and then the pressurized nucleus from the compression which is necessary slowly worked um, the nucleus through mm -hmm. so on an MRI which measures uh, usually hydrogen, depending on what T-weighting you're using. But you see the nucleus working its way through the delaminations of the collagen. So in terms of a transverse MRI, it looks like the nucleus moved. Well, it didn't really move, but it seeped through into invading the layers of the annulus and eventually if you keep doing it it'll it'll work its way all the way through so it appears it's moving right but um, you can vacuum that in I can show you some vacuuming procedures that we found and we would measure their effectiveness Joan measured uh, uh, the uh, uh, effectiveness but talking about McKenzie it's very interesting you know that if the disc is quite far gone it's quite flattened you can do mckenzie prone press-ups till the cows come home and the patient will usually say they're worse right you you've you've really irritated the facet joints if the person has 70 percent of their normal disc height remaining or more mm -hmm. in other words the disc isn't completely flattened you can vacuum it back in and th through a directional preference, preference. Yeah. yes um uh, now, we would have a person prone on a table, give them a little bit of traction, 
and then we would do a windshield wiper action on their ankles and we just watch their pelvis and we just want to see a little roll in the pelvis that subtle little motion helps vacuum in the nucleus through the delamination layer so if you re-MRI it would look as though the nucleus has moved but it hasn't you vacuumed it in through the delaminations in the collagen. So there's a little bit of an explanation on does it move. Now sometimes, it, remember the radiologist who I said who could get the plug to come right out of his neck and then suck it back in? Yeah. So that is you're actually getting something to move through an open fissure mm -hmm. in, the, uh, in the annulus. But uh, as you know, I don't like prone uh, press-ups. Uh, part of Joan's thesis was uh, or it was after that, it was another study we did, pardon me, we compared active extension, like a McKenzie prone push-up, to just sitting there with your uh, fists stacked under your chin, or maybe on your elbows. We think that's pretty aggressive. But nonetheless, you could vacuum in the nucleus in the way that I just described, just as effectively with a static posture as you could dynamic. So why irritate and wear the facet joints through a dynamic floppy push-up when just a prone static posture would be just as effective without being so irritating. Because as you know, long-term McKenzie press-ups quite often will create an extension intolerant patient. So now you had flexion intolerance from the delaminated collagen and now you've got a person who's motion intolerant. Both flexion and extension is irritating their back. So there's a little bit of a, an overview. Does it move? Well, the centroid of volume moves, uh, but is it actually displacing uh, collagen fibers? No, it seeps through the delamination. Right. What do you does think, that answer your question? It does perfectly. What do you think the mechanism is for the patient, the younger patient who comes into us side shifted? So they've done research on you know the person who comes into us basically yes. like this, and they're finding that you know, the nucleus isn't what's moving on that patient, which that was the theory forever. What do you think the mechanism is on that? It's well, obviously a protective pattern, but... Yeah, um, again, I don't know, but I will dispute that uh, in that it's usually a, um, uh, a, a not a central disc bulge, but it will be to one side, either to the right side or to the left side, but now here's the rub. Interestingly, if you take a person who has created a disc bulge from weight training or lifting something heavy, it's almost always a posterior disc bulge. So what happens is they repeatedly flex and the hydraulic effort, and I can show you this on the models downstairs, if you bend forward and squeeze, the hydraulic effort is shaped posteriorly. So you get a posterior disc bulge. So that is of the strength training individual or person who's lifted a load if the person is a yoga master and they have a disc bulge and they haven't been lifting heavy weights the opposite might happen so a yoga person or someone who's trained a lot of flexibility in their spine when you bend it and then squeeze the disc bulge is on the compression side mm. it would be anterior because the soft collagen matrix, uh, the ground substance holding it all together, causes a bulge in compression. Do, do you see what yeah, I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So now the McKenzieus might say, uh, well, the disc bulge uh, is on that side, but the list goes to the other way. Well, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. It depends on the starting flexibility and stiffness of their spine and the mechanism of whether it was a delaminated collagen or a buckled collagen. See how it can go mm -hmm. either way. Yeah. Oh, it's so, so interesting. And then I think, it, too, you also have exposed that, um, I mean, we can have reniform or kidney-shaped disc. We can have oval-shaped disc. Right. And that can also have an effect on pathology. Can you speak very, on that? Very, very much so. So we did one study on, uh, and, and this was in pig spines, where uh, we took ovoid spines and then we took limacon shaped or shaped like a kidney bean. Um, it's much easier actually to herniate a limacon shaped disc uh, because it creates focal stresses 
at the edges of the limacon, so posterior lateral, right where the exiting foramen is, is where the highest stress is on a limacon shaped disc. Now, curiously, those are the bigger, uh, and we see this in people as well. So go back and look at all your at all of your MRIs of your patients who have a unilateral, posterior lateral uh, disc bulge, and you'll find that they have a limacon shaped disc. Mm. Those are the ones that respond best to McKenzie extensions with a side glide. Now, an ovoid disc is a different animal. Um, it doesn't focus the stress the way a limacon does because it's the shape uh, of the disc. The radial distance from the middle of the disc is also another factor. So you can take a thin willow branch and bend it back and forth with no stress, won't break. You take a thicker branch and bend it once to the same level and it shatters because the stress in a round tube is a function of its radial distance from the neutral axis. So a hollow tree that has uh, you know, a big old hollow oak, it won't blow over in a windstorm. It doesn't use the middle for strength. It uses the distance, the largest radius from the uh, neutral axis in the middle. So it's the same with spines. So you wouldn't get a big 400-pound uh, heavy-boned offensive tackle and ask them to do sit-ups. That Or do you know of one, and I've worked with some of these guys, so I know the answer to this. Do you know of one world-class strongman competitor who does sit-ups? There's not one. They <laughs> right. could, it, it would be very, very high stress on their discs. Now, could you take a smaller framed gymnast uh, type of uh, athlete? Yeah, the, the, sure. The, the, do you see what I mean? Oh, the, yeah. the stresses and the chance of them having an ovoid spine is, is much greater. Uh, you, you, you see that some of these disc shapes actually characterize uh, sport uh, as well. The right. shapes of the facet joints and discs gives them such a mechanical advantage. Uh, you know, if a person's not doing well, I will never be a gymnast because my facets are orientated like this, so they jam up right away when I twist. <laughs> but they're free when I go through flexion and extension. Whereas open facets uh, would character would give me a lot of rotational twist to be a golfer or a gymnast. But if you do repeated extension. Who's your spondylolisthesis patients? Mm -hmm. Who's the ones with the broken pars? The, the gymnasts who, yes, that's exposure to the stress, but it's also genetics. Mm -hmm. What gave them that wonderful rotational mobility in their spine means that when they arch backwards, it's like shingles on a roof. It's a very high stress, whereas my facet just glides back and forth, but I can't twist. So <laughs> yeah. do, do, do you, do, oh, do you see how it... it uh, oh, and by the way, I thought you, you can't differentiate all of this stuff on an assessment. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You, you can. Well, it, and I mean, Nick Stern Barr literally, you know, 50, 60 years ago was telling us, you know, that, you know, discogenic pain is, a, a, you know, one of the more common things we're going to see. And then it's almost like the world shifted away from that. And then I feel like there's been a shift back toward discogenic pain being a big player. The question I want to ask you is, no one ever talks about facet joint pain very much. Do you think that's a player? Do you see it often? What's the mechanism with that? Well, the answer is yes. If you're in this game long enough and you see difficult patients, you see every possible candidate mechanism under the sun. Mm -hmm. And you see them because you investigate them and unravel them and you don't finish or stop until you've understood the mechanism. As I used to say to my students, uh, if you can't find the mechanism, go back and look again. You miss something. <laughs> <Look harder. laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, when we go back to the wonderful early work of uh, Bill Kirkaldi Willis, yeah. do, do, do you remember uh, uh, Kirkaldi Willis? KW, he used to be known as. Wonderful. He was a flying doctor in Kenya. You know? Was he really? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. He had such a wonderful life story. But anyway, uh, it was his book, Managing Low Back Pain, that for the first time he really showed the world the cascade of typical back pain. So very, very rarely would you see the initial damage to a facet joint. When you think about it, yes, you could, you could get that in an impact, no mm -hmm. question, motor vehicle accident, uh, etc. But for non-impact back pain, 
the in, the initial would be rather rare to be a facet joint. It almost always is something is off a little bit with the disc. So you might have lost a little bit of disc height, which now adds a little bit of laxity to the joint. It puts more control movement responsibility on the facet joint, so they're bearing higher load with deviated postures. The fact that the disc has lost height now puts more load on the facet mm -hmm. joint. So two or three years later, now you'll start to see changes on the facet joints. Now let's do some provocative tests on the facet joints. We'll go into extension. We'll go into extension with rotation and a twist. Really stress that facet joint. Now you've got one stressed in compression and one stressed in tension. Let's say the person says, oh yeah, no, th there's my pain. Okay, well let's stand on one leg. Keep the pelvis level. Don't fall into a Trendelenburg and repeat exactly the same kinematics. Oh, now the pain's still the same. It's pretty close, it's a facet joint. But if the pain went away, then you would say, oh, okay, well, um, let's have a look now. Oh, oh, no, I'm changing my mind. It is a facet joint. Look at the MR. That right facet joint is full of edema. No other facet joint has all that white contrast inside it. Um, if you did a PET scan, there's that facet joint lighting up like a like a Christmas tree. Right. So, uh, you know, you've tested it. Now let's, uh, <laughs> when you start working and tracking the uh, efficacy, which we did at the university, we tracked the efficacy of every single patient we ever saw. That was the one thing that I, I put in when we when we put that clinic together. Um, to wind down a disc, you know you can do it within five minutes with some patients. Mm -hmm. that, that's possible. Mm -hmm. you just lay on your tummy for five minutes, stand up, oh yeah, my pain's gone. Okay. Could you do that to a facet? No. Mm -hmm. If a facet is wound up and sensitized, um, you will see maybe on average six weeks, three months for that facet joint to slowly wind down. That's bone pain. That's that's articular surface pain. That's just not something that you can wind down right. very, very quickly. So to, to answer your question, do we see it? Yes, when the pattern fits, it's usually secondary to joint change, uh, kinematic changes from uh, something odd with the disc. The disc mm -hmm. might, might be uh, damaged and, and injured, so the stress strain curves, the mechanics of the disc has changed, and uh, yeah, now the facets become a pain generator, and you can test it and wind them down, and lo and behold, their pain uh, hopefully will will go away. The first chapter of uh, Kirkcaldy Willis's book, I think, it is so good. He talks about like treating patients and the difference between clocks and clouds. Like clouds are very hazy, clocks are very mechanistic, and we're, you know, we can find what's what's broken on the clock, we can fix it, and now the clock's gonna work. So what he said, human beings are very complex. So I think all of us are very, you know, mechanistic in our thought process. So how do you deal with all these different layers? I think, you know, the, the fancy term is the biopsychosocial model. How does that play into your assessment and how you manage your uh, your patients? I've read, and my former students used to show me this as a professor, oh, someone has said that you're just a biomechanist. What do you know about pain? And yet, when, they, when a visiting clinician uh, comes, and by the way, when a patient comes here, I always invite their medical staff. So if they're an athlete, they come with Good the idea. entire medical yeah. staff. Or uh, a lot of my patients are celebrities, VIPs. They come with their private physician. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what was the question again? I was, uh, um, how do you reconcile oh, yeah, the so, so, and, and then yeah. they'll say to me, that was the most biopsychosocial effort I've ever seen. And uh, it, so let me start this way. Um, in, a, in the most broadest sense, pain has to start somewhere. It isn't just a figment of someone's imagination. Sure. So it has to come from somewhere. And I've given you some examples where anatomy, we say, loads the gun. Mm -hmm. But you, it's like smoking. 
you need an exposure to get the cancer to start after smoking. Now you can still get cancer, of course, uh, but but it, it's smoking is the trigger to the underlying anatomy. So um, exposure and back pain pulls the trigger. Then psychosocial milieus modulate how that person handles the pain. Mm. So it might have a, so I was a professor. I, I had a few uh, back pain episodes. I could still go back to work. It was no problem. But I couldn't have gone back to be a plumber or a road worker working a jackhammer or something like that. It would have been very, very different. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and the, the pressure to support my family. Um, I see family members enabling uh, certain members uh, they are the invalid and that's where everybody likes them to be and the patient themselves likes uh, being the invalid or you know they have to keep proving to the compensation system that they truly are damaged and right. that they have to keep proving this to everyone that they see and I know as soon as they come and sit on that couch the first thing they're trying to do is prove to me uh, how much pain and disability they have and I say that look my job now is to try and help you get out of pain. Are you interested in that? Because if you're not interested, uh, I, I'm, you know, <laughs> you're, you're seeing the wrong guy. And uh, uh, I, I almost changed the topic and we just become two humans talking. Yeah. And slowly they come around to see what my motivations are. I'm not working for an insurance uh, outfit or a compensation board. My only interest here is to help them be successful in managing their back pain. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, once in a while, there are some who I, I would have to say just enjoy being on compensation. Right. And, you know, but anyway, uh, taking into account the full psycho so social uh, spectrum is uh, paramount but having said that it's not an excuse to dismiss the original reason that there is something that isn't right that is causing their pain mm. and it may be their back or it may not be their back it might be they are a marathoner and uh <laughs> You know, they have uh, an ankle that's rolling. Uh, that puts stress into their hip, into a, uh, uh, an FAI uh, situation. So when they sit down, I see, oh, now they felt the FAI in their hip. So to compensate, they move the pain away by extending their hip and flexing their spine. So there's the pathway. Yeah. Um, it, it wasn't their back. They were the symptom was back pain, and it truly was from their back. But it wasn't something necessarily wrong with their back that led to the pain. If I went through the linkage, I might find an alternate. So uh, there's an That's example, perfect. Mm -hmm. or it it might be just you know, <laughs> I saw something the other day uh, about uh, oh looking at cell phones doesn't affect. Uh, neck pain and then they cited a study on children and I thought well I could do a study on uh, children who smoke as well and cancer isn't going to show up yet <laughs> right. so you're just more fun to hang out with, right? yeah so <laughs> you know cool. they, they, these are the things that take years of exposure to uh, manifest but you know it, you got to be kidding me a person comes in and they say well I, I've, I've got uh, this sore neck it goes all the way down to my back and uh, I uh, saw them in, the, in my driveway doing their texts before they came in. So I've observed their behavior already. I take them down to the clinic. I have them stand there. I do a few tests. They don't have any pain. And I say, would you look all the way down now? Good. Uh, keep your head there. Now, uh, tell me about your kids. Yes. And, and then uh, and they said, oh, my pain's coming now. <laughs> so I, I said, good. Uh, good, go. good. And, uh, what do you think caused it? Uh, what do you mean? I said, well, you just mimicked using your cell phone that caused your pain. And when, you, when we stopped you doing that, your pain went away. Oh, and then uh, I had one 
uh, was that last week now? We did a study, and uh, I'm still publishing papers. Uh, one of our master clinicians, a fellow named uh, uh, Dr. Lysander Jim, he's a physician out in Pasadena, California. He came here, and we were playing jazz with a couple of patients, and um, he was telling me about a patient who had mechanical resonance in the anterior obliques. Resonance is a resonant frequency activation between 8 and 10 hertz. In other words, it's the shivering frequency. <laughs> That's 8 to 10 hertz. Every time they stressed their T9 inflection and compression, their abdominal wall went into resonance. Oh, and you could see it. And I would measure this on my uh, uh, EMG work because that's what we used to use on documenting patients. Every time we saw it, I went through my clinical records and I found, I think it was six patients over my history who had mechanical resonance. Every single one had a T8, 9, or 10 pathology at that joint. Hmm. Why? That's where the thoracic nerves come from. And it created this resonance. So we had a patient uh, last week with that. And uh, I uh, just got them. Would you take your shirt off? Good. Do a cat camel for me on the exam table. T9, perfect hinge. P9, perfect hinge. Not a nice garden hose curve, stress-free of their back. They had a stress concentration right at T10. I said, okay, hump up like a camel. Oh, yeah, there goes my belly again. You know. Oh. Now, was that not a precise diagnosis? No, I tell the story. Uh, this, <laughs> anyway. uh, unfortunately, I had a guy. I'm who talking had, too much. No, I mean, you're doing uh, perfect. Uh, you, you, know, you can let you awesome. uh, tell your stories. No, I, I had the exact same thing. A guy um, got done, really stiff thoracic spine, wasn't respiring correctly, poor scapular stabilization. So I you know, did my bit, and he gets up, he's got a shirt off, and I saw all the muscles, exactly the same thing, but it was uh, more of in his thoracic spine directors. Just same thing. Just start gyrating like that. Never seen it before. So I'm like, okay. He, I didn't help him by the way that time. So he comes back next time. He's like, I'm exactly the same. I get done, you know, doing my treatment, get up, and the exact same thing happened again. And talking about pattern recognition, I always tell the story. So I get an X-ray. He had breast cancer, and it had metastasized to his back. And the story I tell is like, you don't always know exactly what it is, right? But like, I had never seen that before so therefore that's what kind of led me to start thinking about some other things and that's interesting because that's exactly what uh, my patient had may, may, may i go back to your previous question now because you just triggered something yeah, that's absolutely. very very important for me to say on occasion we'll get a patient that just foxes us the pattern doesn't fit exactly like what you just did with that uh breast cancer person I'm afraid that there's many clinicians today that would say if the pattern doesn't fit, they default to the pain is in your head. Oh, yeah. That's exactly right. And uh, wait a second. If the pattern doesn't fit, your, your, your job has just begun. Now you must investigate why the pattern didn't fit. Brett and Taylor, we've uncovered cases of tumor, cancer, many times and saved people's lives yeah. we've also had people who they were beyond the point of no mm -hmm. return but for the first time they discovered a cancer and they then succumbed to right. exactly mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we found aortic aneurysm uh lung embolism uh things that are super red flags these are life-threatening because we didn't default to say the pain was in their head right we knew there was something that we so uh, that that's a very important and i'm glad you 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 brought that up keep investigating now and make the pattern fit because there is a reason why they have pain it's not non-specific yeah i've heard you use the term like and i like using the term too like three times today and that's pattern recognition i feel like the best clinicians in the world and i always tell the story about bobby fisher because that's what he did to become the best chess player in the world they asked him they said bobby it, it's almost like you're cheating how do you know my next move and the five next moves and he said Be from the age of five on I was recognizing it, paying attention. And then when things look a little bit different, then you have, you know, it opens up all these other options. In American football, we say calling an audible. You know, you, you do something different because of that pattern recognition. You've been around all the best clinicians in the world. Do you find that that's one of, the, that's one of their gold medals that they do really, really, really well? I'm going to extend your question and answer by saying, high performance people no matter what it is they're high performing in doesn't matter whether they're a clinician 
an athlete, uh, a business person, yeah. they are outstanding at recognizing patterns. Mm -hmm. Now, who are some of the best pattern recognizers? Criminals. I've had some incredible <laughs> criminals that I've worked with. <laughs> yeah. They know who the mark is. Oh, here's one for you. I ha the guy who, who uh, won Poker Stars in Vegas was sitting right where you were. And I wouldn't let him go until I got him to give me a lesson in, what are you reading? How do you know what the card is? I'm going to go get some cards. Let me, I'm going to pull a few cards here. What's in my hand? And you know how many times he got it was mind-boggling. Okay, tell me what you saw. And he went into my eye movement. He went into my breathing pattern, subtly changed. Uh, a bat of an eyelid. It was it was fabulous. And then we both sat in front of the mirror, and I took pictures of this. I, I, I tr tried to get the expression out of my face. Try and sit passionless in front of the mirror. And then he had to. He was right beside me. Every time he could have zero expression, and I couldn't get rid of expression out no. of my face. It was impossible. And I said, "Well, you know, what do you do with the guys who wear a, a hat brim and sunglasses?" He says, "I love that." Yeah. He says they're just hiding it even more. I can see it even better. Yeah. So anyway, to answer your question, pattern recognition. Uh, when I talk about, uh, I do a little mini course on high performance athletes because I've worked with the the best I'm not joking the best the gold medalist uh, Olympian so the fastest the strongest I don't know how many power lifters and strongmen I've worked for but an awful it's lot. impressive yeah uh, fighters uh, the, the big pro sports players and with the exception of power lifters none of them test the strongest in their sport so obviously if you're strong and you're a power lifter you're, you're going to do well in your sport but is the is the best or, or is the strongest player in the nhl the best player not by a long shot nor in the nfl nor in the nba what are they if, if you ask me yes they they do things well but sometimes their athleticism is not overwhelming mm. and and we could Name names. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Gretzky is the, Gretzky's the example. Oh, yeah, Gr Gretzky's the example. Brady, uh, yeah. you know, I, I again, I was watching his films not too long ago from his uh, uh, combine uh, as, as a rookie. And, uh, you know, what is it? It's pattern recognition. Yeah, pattern that is recognition. Awesome. So who, I mean, you've been around all the best clinicians. Who, give us one or two names, because you've shared stages with Vladimir Yanda. You've been with Robin McKenzie. I mean, you've been with all these great clinicians. Who has really impressed you, not necessarily with their hands, but just in their uh, pattern recognition? Well, when I was younger, it was Yanda. Right. He would just watch people walk in a room, and then he knew who he was going to pick out and, and work with. And I like to think I got a little bit of that just through studying what he uh, did. Right. Um, but uh, now there's someone who uh, I've never met is Michael Leahy. Mm -hmm. Now, I've uh, worked with uh, some of his um, protégés. Sure. And uh, some of their recognition skills are fabulous. Um, do you remember the name Dick Earhart? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yep. So Dick was Shirley Sarman's first graduate student yeah. as, a, as a bit of uh, St. Louis yeah. boy. Yeah, I watch you. And, um, uh, you know, he, he did a lot of papers with uh, Tony DeLito and Julie Fritz. Yeah, can you categorize? Yeah, yeah. the subcategorization mm -hmm. papers. And um, I, I wonder what the people who say you can't diagnose say about all of that science. <laughs> they don't look at that science. <laughs> oh, well, anyway, uh, Dick, uh, so Tony DeLito and Dick Earhart would um, invite me down to University of Pittsburgh. When I was a younger professor, it was a wonderful thing they did. I would go down uh, every winter and uh, tell them what's new and hot in uh, spine biomechanics. Because I really wasn't a clinician yet at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't remember, I didn't go to medical school. I, I was the other end. I was <laughs> the mechanical engineering side. But anyway, Dick, I would stay at his house. And uh, he lived in one of the old steel magnets homes in, in oh. Pittsburgh. <laughs> he had this guest wing that I used to stay in. And, and Dick was post-polio. 
uh, I don't know if you're. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he had, uh, you know, a brace on his leg and whatnot. And I, and you could always tell by his gait pattern. If you, mm. if you listened to it, you know, I knew it was Dick coming down the hall. <laughs> and, uh, oh, bless his soul. <laughs> He's not with us anymore. And I'll tell you that story as well. But uh, anyway, um, for some reason, I just really hit it off with Dick. Dick was a chiropractor. He was a physical therapist. And he was a professor. And he taught clinical skills at Pittsburgh with with Tony and that uh-huh. whole crew there and I don't know why but he took a shining to me and I would just spend days in the clinic with him learning the touch and the feel and the magnitude and the angle and how to play jazz to nuance and romance pain or pathology mm-hmm. and to feel it right pick up both legs this one's heavy oh yeah oh it just got light Oh, we just tensioned the femoral nerve root. And then he, I, I could feel that. And um, now I, I can't even remember why we're asking you, quite, but it was people who did pattern recognition, yeah. Yeah. I think. You did the best you've been around. The yeah, year, so around. I don't know. Um, th- those days with Dick were absolutely magical to me. Then he got, um, it was a, a kind of a blood cancer. And... Uh, Tony called me up and said, oh, Dick's not doing very well. And uh, by this time, he'd left Pittsburgh. He retired, and he was living down on the Chesapeake. And I had, had some, I was at Virginia Commonwealth University, the med school, doing a uh, talk with, um, oh, here goes my brain again. Now I can't remember. But uh, so I, I rented a car. I thought, oh, I'm going to drive to the Chesapeake. And, and there was Dick. And I, I bawled my eyes out when I saw him. And I'm going to start mm. crying now yeah. if, if I go too much further on this. But he was standing there in a full body brace. The drugs had stolen the uh, mineral from his bones. And he was just fracturing. Mm. So I said, Stu, great to see you. Don't hug me. Can't shake my hand. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, he drove me to, he was a Civil War buff, and he drove me to the Civil War sites and was telling me what battle went on here. Oh, we oh just how special. A, he, awesome. It was a special. And then poor guy passed away soon after that. But um, anyway, wow. there was a, a story on uh, the things That's we used special. to do and the special. relationships we used to have and build and just trade ideas and talk about pattern recognition and uh, serving your apprenticeship. Yeah with different people trying to understand what made them so great and can I learn and copy? Mm, that's perfect. <laughs> Which, yeah. Well, Earhart and Delito, I mean, I think if we look at their research, they were making an attempt to look at different modalities and see how they could be used to treat back pain. So what I want to ask you, Stu, is you're around chiropractors, you're around people that are doing manipulation, manual therapy, dry needling's hot right now. You when, mentioned Leahy, yeah. manual yeah, massage or, or uh, ART, stuff like that. What, what do you think of these modalities in the treatment of low back pain? I know I don't think you do these things in your in your workup, but what do you think about the usage of those? What's their role? And, and then I actually would like to hear your mechanism, like the neurophysiologic event that's happening with manipulation since we're chiropractors and i know you've spoke before on it very eloquently and i would uh that would be the second part of the question so how yeah well i understand your your question so there's two of them but i'd like to reverse the order okay can i answer the second one first let's talk about the science because i usually if i have done the science i'd rather base my opinions and comments on the science let's establish that so um in terms of uh, manipulation, um, now, uh, Greg Lehman, who uh, y- you know, yep. uh, he did his master's degree with me, and, and his master's degree was on uh, measuring the myoelectric response, the muscular response to manipulation. Uh, it wasn't so mechanical from other respects, but, but that's what he investigated. And uh, there, I, I remember a gymnast coming in, a national class gymnast, who had a very peculiar, a little bit of back pain, but a very peculiar, she could put her finger on it. I have pain right here. No one can uh, come up with a precise understanding of this pain. It's always there. It bothers me, but it's worse after I train. 
and doing pattern recognition. It was worst after she stressed her spine. So we had a suspicion. Now, uh, how do you find a muscle tear? As I found through working with ultrasound, which is for me sometimes really good in mm -hmm. the diagnosis. So if you have a muscle, when you watch a muscle contract, its dynamics are the muscle uh, knits together as it contracts. But when you have a multi-layered composite like the abdominal wall, external, internal, and transverse abdominus, uh, you can watch the fibers come together. But if there's a little tear at that one spot, those fibers just in that one spot pull apart and all the rest knit together. Then you get out your pen and you put an X on it. That's exactly where the repair needs yeah. to go. Now, you can do it just by leaving it alone and it will stiffen up, gristle, sure. scar, whatever word you want, or a surgeon can uh, sew it uh, back together. And by the way, uh, what we discovered is you just get the patient to do this, relax. <laughs> and you will see exactly where the tear is. So that was uh, not treatment with ultrasound, but for uh, medical imaging, and I used to use a cardiac probe actually <laughs> to, uh, to, to make these measures. And I can do exactly the same with, with multifidus or some of the other back muscles that on occasion we'll see uh, torn, uh, usually in sportsmen. We couldn't find anything wrong with the mechanics of the muscle at the site of the pain. So she was manipulated. Within, now, I, I don't remember the timing, so I, I didn't look this up. I wasn't prepared to answer this, but I think it was 300 milliseconds. The spasm that we measured existing, that little area of muscle was just active. Hmm. So one little motor unit or, or colony of motor units was just active and it wouldn't let go. So I don't know if you call that a spasm or not. We sure. can argue about the mm -hmm. use of that word. Within 300 milliseconds, in other words, a short loop reflex. The spasm was not gone, but it was greatly quietened down. She said, oh, well. But now that was a spinal manipulation. So I know there's been arguments in manipulation. Is it possible to modulate processes a distal from the spine? Well, there's some proof that it did. Yeah. Now, we also measured uh, in that study and studies subsequent that you can also induce spasms that weren't there in the first place. Mm -hmm. So there was some evidence that the manipulation modulated things on a neural level. Mm. Um, I have uh, chiropractors who will argue, I'm going to manipulate to create some spine stability. And that, now that doesn't add up to me. Because, to create spine stability? Yes, because <laughs> so, yeah, stability, instability is when you've lost a bit of stiffness through injury. We had two people show up at my door here last winter. One was in a wheelchair and one was on crutches. And I said, well, come on in. And, uh, you know, they, they just show up at the door, so <laughs> they know where I live. Good Canadian. <laughs> yeah. And uh, both of them had fallen on ice. Mm. to crack your pelvis landing on ice is a horrible thing we do it every winter here and uh, both of them had been to the same chiropractor and both of them had been manipulated mm. and I thought now what's the logic of someone who's just fallen on ice Their pattern recognition that's all you need to know do you really want to <laughs> manipulate that both of them had fractured pelvises Ugh. yes and uh, I couldn't stand it I went to go see the fella afterwards <laughs> And I, I said, where'd you put the body? <laughs> yeah. I said, you know, come on, what, 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 what what's what your logic yeah. here? What, 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 what? And I've tried to be as polite and as nice and non-confrontational as I possibly could. And he said, well, I thought they had disc bulges. <laughs> what was your assessment that came up with <laughs> yeah, that? Right. You know, and, uh, that was, uh, uh, and anyway, uh, so when I see that kind of practice going on, uh, obviously, that, 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 that's a problem. Yes. Now, I can think of... Uh, so, so there's a little bit on the possible mechanism because I do know it helps with pain control in some people. Mm -hmm. and, and if they say they feel better, I'm not... Pain is what they tell me it is. I'm not going to argue right. with that. 
I've had particularly athletes, high performance people over the years, and I can think of one in particular, and you may not even know who I'm talking about, but this person was a double Olympian. They competed in the Summer Olympics and the Winter Olympics. One of them was a speed strength sport, and the other was um, uh, sort of a speed technique sport. Uh, they were doing squats and deadlifts with lousy form, improper form, uh, improper uh, volume and rest ratios, etc. And they had two disc bulges. So I was able to help them clean up all of that, stay strong, get competitive, but I couldn't get rid of a little nag, as I call it, to use a uh, mulligan term, mm -hmm. a little nag in their quadratus lumborum. And it was truly in their quadratus lumborum. And it was inhibiting their, 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 their training capacity. So I sent them off to another colleague who you know, and uh, uh, because I knew they had magical hands and able to direct a treatment that I have zero skill on, but I appreciate what they do. Mm. And uh, three treatments, uh, the athlete was a hundred percent and uh, never had another back issue till in the next Olympics they tore up their Achilles. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway. So uh, I, these stories I could keep going on and on about, and I, I, I don't have a definitive opinion. Uh, there's actually very few things I have a very definitive opinion about. Sure. Especially well, you get older, you know, you kind of... Well, I hope I've always been that way, but you're probably right. Yeah. Uh, I, I get a bit more... Uh, uh, the, the, well, I was department chair for... A number of years at the university and, and you have to settle and mediate a lot of things and you learn there's always two and probably three sides to every story and, and you learn that with science as well but anyway um, I, I don't know if that answers your well the, your you know question. the deep yeah. intersegmental muscles like multifidus rotatory they're obviously probably being affected with you know whenever we do any kind of manual therapy or manipulation so do you think Maybe one of the benefits that uh, is kind of not talked about from manipulation is having an effect on these deep intersegmental muscles when we do quick, fast, in-range maneuvers in the spine. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I'm quite sure of it. And the reason I say that is uh, I remember being at a spine meeting, and I even remember the fellow's name, um, but uh, there was... Uh, uh, a seminar and I quite often uh, went to seminars where I had no expertise in just to see what was going on and, and this was a spine uh, neural seminar and uh, they brought in this fellow who was an expert in muscle spindles mm -hmm. and uh, he went on about muscle spindles and he said a few things about the spine so I asked him in question period I, I said well where do you collect these muscle spindles from he said, well, of course, uh, I get them from monkeys. I shoot them out of the tree. And uh, he says, the most spindle-rich muscle are the small rotators and intertransversari of the spine. Well, I know those muscles because I roll them around in my hands and I feel them. They don't feel like muscle. Contractile muscle is soft. It's contractile. But those muscles are uh, a bit gristly but they're length transducers. So when you look at how they're arranged around the spine and when you do a little bit of a, a, a twist, those are the muscles that you tweak. If they are the muscle spindle rich ones, now we can start to explain the 300 millisecond short loop reflex. I believe they are position sensors for the motor control system. Mm -hmm. And when you tweak them, you get neural responses. So uh, uh, yes, I do think that when mm -hmm. I have measured uh, chiropractors set up in the full rotation. Now, there are some brutal ones who just... <laughs> <laughs> and I've been uh, the on subject the end on the receiving end to that. And uh, in, in fact, I can also tell you a story. I, I had to crawl for about three days after a Me too. When, when <laughs> I, I was too. a... Uh, I, I used to be a football player, uh, believe it or not, 40 years ago. But in any case, um, and then someone else and it is the minimal displacement, the highest velocity, just a little boop. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a difference. So, um, uh, and, and I'm gonna say something else which you might find interesting. You know, you go on these speaking tours and they'll have other speakers there and uh, I'm, I might, as you know, I'm hip replaced and I've 
led a, a, a very full life, so I've had a lot of injury. And I'll say something, and then they'll say, oh, let me have a look at that. Well, I've learned, don't let those guys yeah, touch no, me now. Never. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I used to say, oh, well, okay, let's go and let's have a beer, and we will try one of your magical treatments. <laughs> the next day, I'm so crippled, I can't get up on the stage anymore. But anyway... <laughs> Um, but it's the, the ones who are the speakers out there speaking about it, it turns out that they don't see a hell of a lot of patients. Yeah, and, and the some of them have brutal required. clinical skills. Um, I want the guy who, who's got, uh, I'm not kidding when I say this, a hundred Olympian efforts with medals who he has helped them or she yeah, yeah. has helped them get there. That's the person who I want to, I've learned who, who I want to see. And they're, they're usually the quiet people in the background. They're not the ones out blowing their horn. But uh, anyway, uh, I, I don't know if that... Uh, well, you know, Yanda, he originally developed his balance sandals, these sensory motor boards. And the thought was like, when we put people on these labile surfaces, that, that is a way to tap into these deep intersegmental muscles. And I don't know what's happened, but you don't hear that much about it. I guess the contemporary rocker board or wobble board is like a vibration plate now. Do you think that there would come a time when you might use like a wobble board or a rocker board in an attempt maybe to affect these deep intersegmental muscles or not something you would do? Or what do you think of Yonda's well, whole... You'll... Oh, so No, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, you'll see down in the clinic a wobble board. Okay. Yes. Um, so we, we, we do use them, but I don't know if it's necessarily for that, uh, reason. I usually use them more for think of when you've hurt your back or when one of your clients hurts their back and you get them to go back. Well, there was one episode. And if they can name that one episode, tell me about that episode. Oh, well, I was lifting this. I got a little bit out of position or, you know, I bent down and picked up my grandson and I wasn't thinking about it or whatever. It was a little error in motor control. And uh, uh, let's say I have a, a world-class strongman and they're getting tired now and we're starting to measure those little motor control errors. So they correct them with their back. I had one fellow who wanted to set the world record powerlifting for his age group. And uh, as he was just, he was training too much in one session and he was just going into a little bit of a thoracic bend and he herniated, I think it was T4 in oh. his, in his uh, thoracic spine. And so it was a matter of not um coaching him out of if he if you're under a thousand pounds and you're two millimeters out of your line of drive the thrust line from the bar down through your linkage to your foot if you're out two millimeters under a thousand pounds that can matter mm -hmm. and if your spine isn't just right if your hips just aren't right your knees aren't just right so i have to give him not a spine strategy because under a thousand pounds you can't do it mm -hmm. it's I don't know if you've ever been in the room when Brian Carroll's squatted 1,300 pounds to God, be in the insane. room and feel that electricity. Oh. It is ungodly. My point is you, you help them by giving them strategies through the feet, through the ankles, through the knees, through the hips, not through their spine. But what do they do when they get into trouble? They freeze their hips and pry with their back. Mm -hmm. They just had their acute episode again it's repetitive right. and then the nucleus is on the wall right <laughs> <laughs> well it, maybe it's an end plate fracture sure. maybe, maybe it's something else but my, my my point is the wobble boards give us strategies now so for me they're more of uh tuning in an ankle strategy a knee strategy a hip strategy um very very uh, important with the combat of athletes that we mm. use, the jujitsu boys, submission specialists, uh, boys, what am I saying? The last one here was a girl, so bo people, <laughs> sorry. Um, anyway, uh, that's when uh, I use those, and I use them with older people, of which I'm one now. So I do balance training, uh, hip power, I fall a lot. Uh, I spend a lot of time in the woods. I trip over logs and sticks that grab my feet, it seems, more and more. And I have to keep hip power now to recover from a stumble. Mm -hmm. And being hip replaced, I've had a lot of those sensors cut, uh, obviously. And uh, I, I, the wobble boards is, are very much part of my strategy to, to try and keep my balance tuned 
so I can recover from a stumble or manipulate loads just a little bit better because I still work heavily as you as you know yeah mm-hmm. so you, anyway that's how I use the yeah. wobble boards I, I don't go to the mechanism that I'm challenging the uh, spindle rich small rotators I might be that made me think of a story I remember uh, me you and some of our friends went swimming in Naples you remember that when it was like literally 20 degrees we might have had a couple drinks before and then we went out yeah. in the ocean and we were yeah. We were a mess. Uh, I remember no you se- ran good that night. Well, no sex for a week after that, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah. have, you know, we have had some good times. We've had a lot of fun together. Oh, you man. know that house was destroyed in the last hurricane? I did not know that. Yeah, it was. Clayton sent me some photos. It was a heartbreak. Yeah, that is that is a shame. Yeah, it but it was a, a nice, lovely beach house on the beach in Naples, Florida. And... Uh, can I tell a story now? Because I think you were at that meeting. Was that the meeting with, with Pavel, Pavel Kolesh? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I know you know Pavel. Do you know mm-hmm. Pavel? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, wonderful personality to, to talk with. So it was Clayton had organized a meeting in Naples where he brought in Pavel Kolesh of DNS fame uh, and uh, Elena Kovasova yep. from Prague. And... It was a very clever uh, talk about high pressure. Uh, Clayton brought in three patients. One was a uh, active UFC fighter. One was the second fastest woman in the world. Hadn't she won a silver mm-hmm. in sprints at Tokyo Olympics? No, Tokyo was it, or was it Beijing? Beijing, I think it was. And then, um, yeah, Tokyo was a little long ago. It was Beijing Olympics, and then. Um, Golfer. Yeah, the third was a duffer golfer, yeah. like a good club mm-hmm. golfer, but not a not a tour player or anything like that. But two out of three really top athletes. Pavel would uh, assess the first patient. I had to go down to the swimming pool. I couldn't watch it. Yeah, they were blinded. I was uh, blinded yeah, to the patient, which yeah. is insane. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. Re- but high pressure. Holy smokes! And then we switched. Pavel then went down and sat by the swimming pool, and I was brought up. And I remember cell phone. I hadn't even had a cell phone by this time. And I thought, oh, this is cool. You can phone someone down by the pool. Uh, In any case, we got the cell phone call. I went up. So I saw the same patient. So the audience watched Pavel assess this person, blinded to me. And then I assessed the person, blinded. Now, you saw the two assessments. Yeah. I never did, and then we did the fighter, and then we did the uh, uh, the golfer, and that was it. And then we all went to this beach house and had beers, and and so I would go up to people like Brett after, and I said, "Well, tell me, how did we do? Was I did I stink the place out, or did anyway?" I think it was the consensus of the audience that, um, and this is a very powerful. Uh, uh, set up and conclusion. We both took very different paths in our assessment of the three people, but in all three cases, we arrived at the same conclusion. Hmm. Was that accurate? No, that's a hundred percent accurate. Okay. Yeah. So there you go. For these people who say, well, you can't reach a precise diagnosis. I'm not saying there's a precise way to reach that. And he thinks very differently than I do. I don't understand how he plays with reflexes, and and I just don't get it. Um, I don't think he quite sees how I manipulate stress concentrations and migrate them through to body and track, because he never asks about pain. Right. Whereas I'm continuing... He doesn't want to know a history. Yeah. A history is very important. I, I, yeah, yeah. I do heavy pattern recognition, and I'm trying to get the pain to move and migrate and grow and shrink, and so I can understand it. But he doesn't do that. So it, it, it was a real eye-opener for me and humbling, but so nice to know that there we are, two different people, very different training philosophies and skill sets, but... Three out of three, we, we both arrived in exactly the same place. And I, I wanted to ask you about this because I've really, you know, I think it's one of your greatest attributes, Stu, is like you've never uh, shied away from a fight or a challenge. <laughs> so you have been, uh, you've been the fed to the wolves down in Australia with Paul Hodges. You've shared stages with Greg Cook, uh, Gary Gray, 
collage, obviously, Yanda. So, you know, and you've always showed up. Can you, can you talk about some of those experiences when you've kind of gone, they've almost tried to like pit you against people, how you prepare for that, what you took away from that and, uh, your overall experience in those, in those settings, which I'm sure can be a little bit awkward. Well, very much. It's awkward. Um, what you appreciate is, uh, people pay their dues and you know i was watching uh the fight on saturday night with um uh molly mccann mm -hmm. the meatball mm -hmm. and uh who's that girl that she uh young american girl 23 yeah, year old know. i can't remember her you name but... that girl has skill oh my god she's impressive yeah. but you know afterwards it was such a genuine love affair afterwards and you know i i've dabbled in training uh combative situations and i've i've always played physical sport and i've always admired my opponents and so often you'll hear the combative athletes where their life is on the line my life isn't on the line it's, <laughs> it's just a bit of pride and uh, but you know thank you you brought the best out of me and GSP, the great George St. Yeah. Pierre, yeah. GSP thanked his opponents for bringing the best out of him. Uh, you know, Matt Brown, it's no secret, uh, uh, he, he's, a, he's a good friend, and, and Matt's exactly the same way, to, to have someone who brings the best out of you, and you could die because of it, <laughs> is an incredible thought. So anyway, it's always been an attitude that uh, highest respect to... Uh, uh, these people who uh, have used for a reason and uh, you know once in a while I'll, I'll have to go in with an opinion and say you know I haven't quite thought of it that way before thank you and it's helped me to uh, keep growing mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I you know it, of course it's nerve-wracking but it, it's never been nasty do you remember when um, uh, I had a, a conversation or a debate, if you, some people called it, with Gray Cook. Yep. And it was uh, at Stanford University. Mm -hmm. uh, Craig Levinson had organized this thing. And it was just the beginning of social media. And there were some people going on, oh, this is going to be a bloodbath. And then if, it was, <laughs> if the person was a disciple of Gray Cook, Gray Cook is going to smash McGill. And then if it was a disciple <laughs> of McGill, McGill's going to smash Gray. It was just awful. And I would read these things and i say, well, I have to do this. I have to show people how you behave in a in an academic conversation where at the end of the day we're only trying to help people yeah that's all mm -hmm. and gray i mean i i'd met him many times before we've had a lot of beers together he's gray's a wonderful guy yeah oh to, God, to he's talk best. to he's he, he is he's fabulous and you know he doesn't have a mean bone in no. his body mm -hmm. and he's a wonderful thinker do i agree with all what he says no and i'm sure he says the same with me but now he's a I would love to go spend a week in the woods with Gray, Gray Cook, and we've and, done it. It's amazing. Yeah. It'll, it'll take a couple years off your life, but yeah. <laughs> but anyway, my point is uh, simply that. And what social media seems to have done to me is, it's you're no longer allowed to have a conversation and a real disagreement of fundamentals with a person, and yet remain friends. Mm -hmm. Well, what, what's happened to this? Yeah, it's very true. And, yep. you know, the, the best times I have are with people who have a different opinion. And, but, okay, from here until three o'clock, we're going to have a different opinion. And then after that, I want to know about your kids. I want to know what turns your crank. And let's go have some fun. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, some of the guests we've had here over the years, we've had so much fun. And yet... Uh, Academically, they, they would be uh, a Republican and a Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, before we get too much into politics, we'll wait till this turns off a little bit. But uh, before we even do it, we've already gone about an hour and a half. So, oh really? I know. Great conversation. We've and we haven't had a beer yet. Michelle. I know. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, so we're we're gonna stop this episode here uh, for now and uh, grab a drink, maybe uh, catch our breath a little bit, and then before we move downstairs to the clinic and maybe get into a little bit more assessment. And uh, I, I know we've got some abdominal wall things t- teed up because I know Brett wants to talk about that a little bit, but. Yep. Uh, thank you for again for sitting down with us too. Uh, it, it was a perfect start to this conversation. I can't wait to continue it. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Taylor and Brett, for flying all the way up here. I'm, I'm glad you're finally crossing the border. Oh, me too. And uh, me too. It, it, if we had more time, we'd go out and uh, have some fun. I'd love to show you around. This won't be the last time we're here, so don't worry about that. Beautiful. Thank you. All right. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Gestalt Education Show. Uh, if you liked it, share it, subscribe to it, uh, send it to your friends, send it to someone that needs to hear this message. Uh, we really want everyone to be able to, to tune in and, and get the, the best clinical advice that they can, which uh, we're hoping that we're giving to you with these special guests. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us, or if you have any suggestions on upcoming uh, conversations, let us know. Uh, for a list of our upcoming courses, we're adding them all the dang time. So go to gestaltedu.com, click on courses, and they'll all be right there for you. All right, have a good day.